Let your power fall, let your voice 
Spirit, come and fill this place this morning. As we come before you, empty ourselves of all of us, that we might have all of you. Come and change our hearts. Let your fire fall. Come in power. Speak through your messenger this morning in a way that's never been heard before. That our lives will be changed and ignited to be on fire for you. In Jesus' name. Rain down. necessary to relay the foundation 
And I want to share that with you this morning. I want you, church family, to know the priority of Calvary Baptist Church. And I believe it's here in this declaration of faith that, God, that John gives that we are going to share in this morning. John, as he starts this epistle, in this first chapter, deals with his relationship with Christ and the only foundation that matters. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life that was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare it to you. The eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Christ Jesus. We are rewriting these things so that our joy may be made complete. Now this is the message that we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. And there is absolutely no darkness in Him. If we say we have fellowship with Him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and we are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say we do not have any sin, we make Him to be a liar, and His Word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He Himself is a propitiation, the atonement. For our sins. And not only for ours. But for those. Of the whole world. I don't think it gets. Any more foundational than that. I don't think it gets any more simple. Than this. John says. I've walked with Jesus. I've talked with Jesus. I've healed with Jesus. And I'm here to confess today. That Jesus is Lord. That He introduced me to the Father. And the Father is perfect in light. And in the Father there is no darkness. And because of the Father and His love for me, I can be reconciled and my sins can be forgiven. He is propitiation. He is payment. He is atonement. He is hope, and He is worthy of all praise. See, John is declaring to the church something that we need to be reminded about, and I want you to take the same stand that I'm taking as I reaffirm my faith that's centered and grounded in Jesus Christ. For there is no other name on heaven or on earth by which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's an amen moment. Let's try that again. Thank you. There's only one name on heaven and on earth by which everyone who believes can be saved. Not just for one, but for all who will come to the throne of Jesus. Atonement for us. What are we about, Calvary? I like the full house. I don't know how bad the person next to you smells, but I can't smell it from up here. 
I don't know how uncomfortable it is to rub shoulders and not have a good seat and have to find a new place. Because i got all the room in the world. Jonathan's sitting all alone over here. we got a whole pew next to him. And he even looks cleaned up this morning. There's room. I don't know why we're here if we're not here for this message. I think we need to be regrounded. I think we, that, that this week, uh, this weekend, uh, well, actually, this last couple of weeks, uh, uh, a friend was dropping off his son to play with Rustin. And he came in. And he, he's, he's in the construction business. He said, "Have you noticed you've got a shingle laying in the valley in your roof?" I said, "No, I haven't noticed. I don't pay much attention to my roof, quite frankly." And he says, "You might want to take a look at that." So I went and bothered father-in-law's ladder. I got up on the roof this week. I was missing three shingles. I had tar paper. It was open. What happens when your roof is open? We've had some rains, haven't we? I haven't had any leaks that I know of other than a bathtub that overflowed. But that's a whole different, that's a whole different sermon illustration. And so I got up on the ladder. I went to father-in-law's and borrowed permanently three shingles from him because he has the same roof I have. Isn't it nice to have in-laws in town? His ladder, his shingles, and I replaced those shingles. I had to protect my house. I had to complete a work. I had to lay a foundation of waterproofness. I had to make sure that things were right at home. God's calling us as a church to tighten things up. He's calling us as a church to recognize the priorities, the foundations. I think we need to come back to the simple message that John is giving us here. Who is your Jesus? What was from the beginning? As I read it, Genesis, just even the name of the first book of the Bible, that he's got in the beginnings. Anybody know what Genesis 1-1 says? My brain's messing up on me. What's Genesis 1-1 say? In the beginning, right? In the beginning. Who? God. Any of you there? No. So who's most important in this story? God is. Who's God focused his attention on? If he who is most important has focused his attention on us, we need to pay attention to him. In the beginning, what was from the beginning, we have heard. God chose to reveal himself to us. What did Adam and Eve do in the coolness of the evening? They walked with God, didn't they? They heard from the Father. In the beginning was the Word. From the beginning, we have heard. God has never changed. From the beginning till now, He is still where He started. He's in heaven. Where is heaven? Everywhere around us, right? If that's where God is, and God's everywhere. We need a little heaven on earth, don't we? We need a little of His presence here among us and around us. Have you really thought about what this means? That from the beginning we have heard? Now John's talking about physically walking with Jesus. From the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, from the life of Jesus, John was one of those fishermen. When Jesus started his public ministry somewhere around the age of 30, he walked along the seashore. John was one of those guys that Jesus said, Hey, you, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. What was Jesus' purpose from day one? <coughs> to draw the net. To bring people into the kingdom. To reveal the truth of who the Father is through the Son. To live the perfect life. To disciple and to teach those who are around Him. So that we can know the truth of who He is. He says from the beginning we have seen, we have heard. We have seen with our eyes. Is Jesus in the miracle business today? He is. We know He is. But do we give any credit for it? Not the way we ought to. Do we bow on our knees before Him? When was the last time we fought the spiritual battle? Waged war in the spiritual realm? As an individual? As a church? He's called us to do it, hasn't he? 
we have pastoral prayer time every week. That's the only prayer time you get. You're missing out. When Alice and I met at seminary, I gave up sports. I gave up TV. I gave up everything that wasn't nailed down to get a passing grade, which didn't have to be an A, or didn't pay the bills to spend time getting to know her. Because she was important to me, and she was valued by me. We would walk around the seminary campus, and we would talk as we walked. And we got to know each other because she was valued and important. I spent time getting to know her. I knew her well, quickly. Because every moment that wasn't dedicated to passing grades, not A's, passing grades, <laughs> that's how important she was, or work, or service at church, was spent together. And we both graduated with passing grades. <laughs> Isn't God more important than that person? How many of us have prioritized our walk with God the way we have with our spouse? The way we have with our favorite hobby? The way we have with our favorite toy, computer? The way we have with anything else in life? When you find out you're <clears throat> pregnant, you're going to have a baby, and you never had one before, what do you do? Go get the beginner's book, don't you? And you start reading about how bad diapers stink. And all the things you need to keep them from stinking up your house. You get this little diaper genie thing because it's rated really high. On the second baby, do you have a diaper genie? Uh-oh. Because you realize you can tie it in a grocery bag. It's a whole lot cheaper. You learn these things after you spend time doing them, but you study the things that are important to you. Anybody join the, what's the genealogical site where you look up your ancestor? Ancestor, ancestor.com or something like that, right? Some of y'all have members, memberships, right? Some of y'all are looking this stuff up. How much time are you looking up and spending getting to know your great grandpa, <coughs> great grandma, great great so and so? Finding out. You might be related to royalty. John says, in the beginning was God. He spoke to us. We walked with him. He adopted me. And I'm the son of the prince. I'm the son of the king, actually. I'm a prince. You don't have to go other places. How much time have you spent getting to know your father in heaven? We asked a question in Sunday school today. I never got back around to, to trying to give the answer to it. It was simply this. It came out of the discussion. Was Jesus teachable? He's God, right? And he's our master disciple. He's setting the example to us of all the things we're supposed to be. So was Jesus teachable? If he wasn't teachable, are we supposed to be teachable? <laughs> well, I'll tell you right now. I may not be very teachable, but I'm supposed to be. We got a new puppy in our house. I'm learning. It takes a lot of time, patience, and energy to teach a puppy. It makes me feel sorry for God having to try to teach me. <laughs> it can be done, but it takes a whole lot of patience and a whole lot of repetition and a whole lot of treats along the way. But it can be done. Is Jesus teachable? Well, what did Jesus do when he was a young man? His parents took him to the temple. He sat among the scholars and discussed the things of God. In his humanity, because he took on the form of humanity, became human. He added humanity to his godliness. He didn't remove godliness. He just added humanity to it. In his humanity, he learned. And he served. Now, he didn't make mistakes. He didn't have to learn from his mistakes the way we do. He was perfect. John says, we have been with Jesus, we have walked with Jesus, we have heard Jesus, we have seen Jesus, we have observed Jesus, and have touched with our hands the things of God concerning the word of life. We have touched with our hands 
the nail scars of Jesus. The things concerning the word of life. The word of life is a name for Jesus. He is the word of life. He brings hope. You know, when we walk out of this room and go to lunch, I hope you have more in your mind than a plate of spaghetti. If you don't like spaghetti, you just stay with me and we'll keep on going. The word of life is Jesus. He wants us to know Him. He wants us to understand Him. He has given, He has spoken Himself into us. This is foundation. It's who He is. There is hope in Jesus. We need to share this hope, the good news. We need to claim this hope. We need to celebrate this hope. We need to shout from the rooftops that Jesus is worthy. Have you seen Him? First Peter says, I haven't seen him with my eyes, but you're even more blessed because... He doesn't say that about himself. He says about us. Though you haven't seen him with your eyes, you're even more blessed because you have believed without seeing. We have seen the effects of Jesus. We have seen the miracles of Jesus. We have, we have felt the, the salvation of Jesus, the hope of Jesus, the peace of Jesus. But yet we live like the world in defeat. Tucking our tails. Verse 2, he says, that life was revealed. He did this to show us the truth. It's not keeping hidden from us. We have seen it. And we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. It's the second time he says revealed in verse 2. The life that was revealed and declared to you eternal life that was revealed. Eternal life comes from the life of Jesus. Eternal life comes from what Jesus did in the flesh. Communion as we celebrate it. Uh, next week or two weeks out. Two weeks out. The bread and the juice. The life of Christ. The life that was given up for us. The blood that was spilled for us. He did it for us. Always. Our name on His heart. John says we need to Realize it's been revealed to us. If he's not been revealed to you, then let me just ask you to do something real simple. If you don't know Jesus, just ask God to reveal him to you. Because he will. His word will never come back for you. If you search and seek with an open heart and an open mind, the God, creator God of the universe, our Father in heaven, Abba Father, through Jesus Christ our Savior, and you ask with honesty, seeking truth, He will reveal Himself to you. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to walk with Him. He wants to bless you in this relationship. He wants to provide hope for your life, to bring you that peace that passes understanding, to show you a hope for a future. He has been uh, revealed to us, and it's our job to testify to tell the truth, to speak forth plainly, to declare His righteousness, to declare His wonders, to declare His promises, to declare the salvation that comes in Jesus. <coughs> See, you thought this was a simple introduction. This is a marching order for us. We need to come back to this foundation I want you to know that I believe this. And I want you to tell somebody that you believe this. That He is able. He declares to us eternal life. Verse 3 says, we, What we have seen and heard we also declare to you. He continues. Second time He used the word declaration. In verse 2, we testify and declare to you the eternal life. In verse 3, we declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. You ever feel like an outsider? Most of us have, haven't we? Been a part of something that you just didn't belong. You just didn't fit in. Just didn't make sense to you. <coughs> you had to be there. Maybe you wanted to be there. Maybe somebody invited you to be there. But you just didn't connect. The other sermon I was going to preach to you started over in Acts chapter 6. Actually, it starts a little bit before that, but let me just give you the highlights here of not fitting in in a church. You see, the gospel came down to Peter and the boys up in the upper room. The Holy Spirit fell on them. They preached an amazing sermon. 
And over 3,000 people were saved that day. What do you do with 3,000 people who get saved? You start hanging out. You start a foundation of something. But they didn't end there. You see, they kept on preaching. Daily, they were in the temple complex. They were meeting together. They were praying together. They were fellowshiping together. They were eating together from home to home. They had all things in common and all who had needs shared together in those needs. So much so that when Peter and John are getting arrested for doing what they're supposed to do, they look at the, at, at the judge and say, do what you will, but we're going to tell people about Jesus because he's worthy. And they get released. And they find a church in prayer over them. And you know what happens? It says even a great number of priests get saved because of the faithfulness of the people and the witness. And they're meeting together regularly in a place called the Solomon's Colonnade. The apostles would gather there and they would teach daily the things of God. And many are being saved. So you go from 3,000 to 5,000 to many. Now, 3,000 to 5,000 are many. Imagine what God numbers as many. A lot of people's lives are getting changed. And the Pharisees and Sadducees are not very happy about this. Neither is Satan. By the way, who's the enemy of Jesus? Satan. It was not the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Who's the enemy of the church? It is not culture. The enemy of the church is Satan. Who's the enemy of the believer? It's not your spouse. It's Satan. It's not your child. It's Satan. It's not your parent. It's Satan. It's not that bully at school. It's Satan. It's not your boss. It's Satan. It's not your coach. Satan. It's not that weight loss plan. By the way, the skating day is a freebie. What do you call those days, Jonathan? Cheat days. cheat days. Today's a cheat day. Today's a cheat day. Your enemy is not what's on the plate. It's Satan. Who's your enemy? Who's the answer? Jesus. It's real simple. You know what happens in the book of Acts next? The Hellenistic Jews are the Hellenistic Christians and the Jewish Christians. These thousands of people have come together under Jesus Christ. Enemies yesterday, family today. And what happened? A dispute arose among them. For the Hellenistic Christians, the widows and orphans were not receiving their fair share. And so they began to grumble. And word got back to the apostles. <coughs> By the way, these group of men who are about to be called are never called deacons in the Bible. I just want you to know that. Though they operate in a function and in a way in which today we would refer to them as deacons. And they may have been deacons, but they're never called that in the scriptures. Just want to make sure you understand that and know that. Make sure that you know that I know that. See, I just want you to know I'm smart. May not have got A's, but I didn't pay attention. And a dispute arose among them. And the apostles got together and they said, what should we do about this? Because it's not our place to wait on tables. We need to be about the business of proclaiming the name of Jesus. Prayer and equipping of the saints. Proclamation of the gospel. And so they called the people together. The people presented a group of men. And they chose seven to handle the dispute in the church. See, Satan is a real enemy. Even in the first church that was designed so close in proximity and time to the life of Jesus with the apostolic miracles that are taking place in the moment where they, the, these miracles are taking place to bring people to, to, to the knowledge of Jesus Christ by the apostles are so amazing that they're actually bringing the sick, laying them in the streets in the hopes that the shadow of Peter will fall on them and the healing power of Jesus will heal them through the shadow of Peter. Things are happening. And a dispute broke out among them. Satan was at work, even in the foundation of the first church. And, and Satan wanted to rock the faith of the believers. But the apostles said, we stand on Jesus. We're not going to let this happen. Let's appoint seven men who are trustworthy. 
And let's let them minister to the needs of the congregation physically, the widows and the orphans. By the way, I'll go throw in a freebie here since we are doing the deacon thing today. The majority of the complaints or comments that I receive that say, I don't know who my deacon is or my deacons don't do anything or this person's not doing what they're supposed to do come from people who don't need deacon ministry. Let that settle for a minute because that was a shock and that was intentional. I just want you to... So if you're among those... <clears throat> Let that settle. Why, why were the deacons established if these were deacons? Widows and orphans. True ministry needs. Now, am I saying, Pastor, you're saying that I don't have a need? No, that's not what I'm saying. I don't know your situation. This is a general blow across the bow for everybody. Just think about it. If you're grumbling, you're not with Jesus. That's Satan trying to destroy the church. These men's job is to keep the peace among the church. To bring peace to the church. That is their job. So that the work of the church can continue. That is their job. From the beginning, God set this up. That we would be devoted to Him. That we would know Him. That we would teach His things. And Satan wanted to destroy it. Satan is the enemy. Now, I'm not preaching that passage, Acts 6 through 8, but if I was, that's what I would tell you. And you know what happened? As the needs were taken care of, the ministry continued to expand. When we honor God, Jesus is glorified. Even when it starts in grumbling. Not saying it's okay to grumble, the end does not justify the means. But when God is honored in the solution, the church continues to grow. We need to be a people of the book. We need to recognize our enemy. We need to know who we're fighting against. And we also need to know who we're celebrating. We're celebrating Jesus. We have heard and seen and we declare to you so that we may have fellowship among us. The church is designed to have fellowship. It's not designed to be broken. It's broken because of Satan who wants to destroy us. But what we should be doing is having fellowship. Fellowship is more than walking down the hallway and saying, how are you doing? Fellowship is extended periods of time doing life together. Doing life together. It's outside the church building, not just inside the church building. An ice cream fellowship, I don't think is necessarily what God had in mind when he talked about the fellowship of believers. It takes a village to raise a kid. I believe that if it's a Christian village. If it's God's people. We need to do this thing together in fellowship. Satan wants to destroy that which Jesus established. Satan's goal, his only goal, is to destroy that which Jesus established. Jesus established the church. John is saying, what we've heard from Jesus, we're giving to you. We've seen it. We heard it. We declare it so that we can have fellowship, so we can be in right standing with one another. Yet what do we do most often? We grumble. And we build walls of separation. I noticed this last Sunday. I don't know why I never thought about this before, but I was talking about the elders. And, and not the elders as in role, but the elders as in wisdom last week. Have you ever noticed how our Sunday school hour is lined up? It's lined up so that Kenny's class is as far away from possible as Bud's class. Our youngest adults are separated by as much space as possible from our most wise adults. I said that intentionally. I believe that to be the truth. I exempt myself. Not really. Why do we do that? Occasionally we'll have somebody separate age group Appropriateness. You know, we, since I've been here, we have never deemed classes by age number. But naturally, we fall into those places where, where does my age meet? But I think there's some great wisdom in seeing some cross-pollination. <laughs> Most of my greatest influences are a good bit older than me. 
I think it's what's helped me become who I am. Now, if you like that, that's great. If you don't like that, maybe you're scared of that. Find somebody else. I think we need to observe, think about, are we really doing what we need to do? We need to be one fellowship. We need to come together in the unity of Christ. We need to make sure that we recognize who our enemy is and what his desire is. And we need to declare it to be true. His word is true. John says, I've lived it, I've seen it, I've touched it, I've observed it, I've participated in it, and I declare it to you to be absolutely true. I tell you this so we can have fellowship in Christ Jesus. Not just with one another, but also with the Son. And I'm writing you these things that our joy may be complete. What makes a parent more happy, more joyful than anything else? To see the success of their children. John says, I write this so that our joy may be complete. I write this so that I can be joyful about the foundation of the church. That our unity would be complete in Christ Jesus. And this will bring us into fellowship with God. God is perfect. He is light. There is no sin in God. And when we're in Christ, we have confessed our sin. We've been cleansed and made holy and righteous. Though the truth was not in us, the truth is in us in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. He reveals the truth to us. And any time we fall off the wagon, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. Faithful and righteous. He's holy and pure. And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I know I've preached that to you many times. We say we do not have sin. We make Him out to be a liar. None of us are perfect. By the way, why do we judge one another? Why do we look for reconciliation instead of separation? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because if we say we have not sinned, then we make God out to be a liar. If we are sinful, we need forgiveness. We need not be pointing the finger at somebody else and their sin. Their sin is not worse than our sin. We need to be reconcilers, not dividers. Oh, John's preaching to the church here. Don't give me, hear me, hear me clear. This is foundational. John wants them to know what he has seen and observed and was called to pass on. I want to end with, with chapter 2, verses, verses 1 and 2. My little children. John's writing to the church. There, there are some elders who are reading this letter, having this letter read to them. My little children. We act like kids sometimes, don't we? The very worst of childhood comes out in us as adults at times. My little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I'm not being hateful here. I'm not being mean here. I love you and I want to place you on the right path. I want to help you experience life and to the abundance. I want you to have all that God has in store for you. I want you to be protected from the evil one. I want you to experience joy like no other. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But understand if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is going to intervene for you. He's the righteous one. He himself is the propitiation or the atonement, the payment, the perfection, the gift of God for our sins. Not only ours. I want you to get this point. The cost of the cross was not just for me. It wasn't just for Calvary Baptist Church. Though I'm thankful you filled the room. But also for the whole world. I told the Sunday school class I was in this morning, we stole their tables and we sent them downstairs for the luncheon. Without the tables in the room, we got room to double our attendance in that class. With the tables in the room, the class is full. I want you to think about your Sunday school classroom and how full it is. And just imagine if it would have doubled. You know the first thought? I guarantee you some of you just sinned. That won't be comfortable. What, to give up our tables? The angels celebrate more for one lost sinner who repented and came to knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ than for anything as saints do. 
Yeah, the church is a training ground. The church is a, is a place where we come together and meet, we learn, we study, and we hopefully do better. But if our goal is not to win the lost to Christ and disciple them according to the Great Commission, in fact, that in, in the Great Commission, he says, make disciples of all nations. He says, make disciples, which includes the idea of evangelism, but he focuses on the idea that we're supposed to have a fellowship with them, an interaction with them, a journey through life with them. We're not about the business of our Savior. Making disciples of all nations. Training them in the ways of righteousness for His name's sake. That we have failed Jesus. If we are satisfied, then we have sinned. John says, not just for me, but for all who will receive Jesus. I believe we've got the answer to the sin problem. His name is Jesus. I got this belief in my head that we have the answer to the adultery problem. His name is Jesus. I believe we've got the answer to the lying problem. His name is Jesus. I believe we have the answer to your marriage problem. Quit fixing the other person. Get right with Jesus. I believe we have the answer to your kid's problem. His name is Jesus. I don't know what's wrong with your mom. His name is Jesus. We have hope. And I believe it's worthy of worship. Amen. That's <coughs> Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we have the privilege of being in your house today, of celebrating the way we have celebrated, of praying the way that we have prayed, seeking your face on behalf of those who are being persecuted. And now hearing the Apostle John write from prison to the church, saying, I have touched him. I have walked with him. I have listened to him. I have served beside him. And I declare to you that he is worthy of all glory. That he came that we could be saved for all who will believe in the name of Jesus. For he is worthy. I declare to you the truth that He loves you and He hates division and He hates sin and He became propitiation. He died and atoned for our sins. He paid for our sins that we could be made free and made holy and made righteous according to His perfection. So Lord, this morning, help us to repent. Bring us to the foot of the cross. Places on our knees before the one who is worthy. And Lord, be glorified. Lord, prick our hearts today that we would not walk away from Jesus, but we would embrace the mission that we've been given to live it and to share it. The good news of Jesus Christ. Father, as we respond, be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing. As we sing, if you need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, He's there waiting on you at His throne. If you want me to help you walk through that process, just come down to the side and say, Pastor, will you pray with me? Today's the day that I believe in Jesus, that I celebrate salvation in Christ Jesus, that I walk with Jesus. Maybe you need to come from church membership. And you want to say, I want to be a part of this church that's regrounding itself, committing itself, to Jesus, fresh and anew. Come, just share that with us. Let us pray with you. Maybe you need to come for baptism. Jesus not only declared that we should make disciples, but we should baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you've not been baptized in immersion baptism, come and say, I want to set the example that Jesus set before His disciples to this congregation. Maybe you just need to come to the altar. The altars are open. Whatever commitment and recommitment you need to make, won't you come and just humble yourself before the Lord? Glorify Him by your response this morning. We're going to sing.
How do you need to respond today? I'll be here to receive you.
believe God, I believe we all make responses to God every single week. I love it when we get to see what God's doing. So I, I'm thankful for you all being up here this morning. If you'll just stay as we do our final song, as we prepare to, to head out for lunch, we'll slow the crowd down just a little by having them come by and greet you individually. So we expect during lunch you will know everybody's name because they're going to introduce themselves to you. <laughs> and then we'll at least know yours. <laughs> I get asked that a lot. <laughs> I'm Paul. <laughs> All complaints go to Paul, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to bless the food as we dismiss. Now, let me give you that order of what's going to happen after you leave this room, okay? Downstairs, the tables are color-coded by tablecloth. If you don't know what color your table is, there's a list out here on the wall on the left. You will also hopefully see your deacon. Deacons, please stand if you're in the room and then leave and go to your table. <laughs> you have to make me dismiss. Thank you. These are some of your deacons. Patrick, you can stay because you got to turn my mic off, man. I can't be broadcasting. <laughs> you didn't do that at 12 o'clock, and I appreciate that. Roger, my table is the first yellow. Ken is the first yellow. Ken is actually Bud today. So if you're in Bud's deacons list, you're with Ken this morning. It's the first yellow table. All right? You're going to go to your table. You're going to be seated at your table. You're going to find your deacon. If you don't have a deacon, you find me uh, or, or somebody else who's standing up and looks like they don't know what they're doing. And we will help you find a table to be at. We want everybody to be included in this. If you didn't bring anything, that's good because we didn't ask you to. We're providing all this for you. Because we love you, and we want you to know your deacon and get to know them better around the table today. And so uh, after we dismiss, go downstairs to the gym, find your table, be seated around the table, and then we'll dismiss for service by table. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of being together in your house. We thank you for this meal that we're about to take together as a family. And as we sit around the table and break bread, we ask that you would be glorified. That we would celebrate by getting to know our deacons who serve us. That we would celebrate by getting to know other church members who we may not already know. That we would celebrate as we spend this time honoring you and honoring the call to hear the apostles' teachings, to pray together, to fellowship together, to break bread together. Lord, may you be glorified today as we do these things and continue to honor you. Father, thank you for these new families. Thank you for the example that's been set. Help us to continue to honor you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.